So assuming the internet um, is uh, working for us, we're, we're over at Yahoo. I'm already signed into Yahoo. I go to Yahoo every day when I start my browser, so I'm already signed in. It's an account which I'm constantly using. And so from here, it allows me to choose what identity I want to pass to it. It remembers which one I used last. Um, I have my Flickr account as well. So if I were to tell Yahoo that I'm that Flickr user, or if I were to tell Magnolia that I'm that Flickr user, I could go ahead and share where my photos are. So this idea of starting to not just have it be, this is your identity by itself, but who are you on the web? And giving you the ability to choose what you want to share. And so now I'm back at Magnolia, I'm logged in. So not having to type anything in, um, which I think is definitely one of the benefits to OpenID, but um, really more so, this idea of being able to go and start to take more parts of your profile with you as you move around the web, making it easier for you to get into new services. Lots of people have been saying great things about OpenID, um, which is good, awesome. Um, if we take a look at some of the uh, adoption, I mean, this is the sort of graph that you want to see. Um, up and to the right, starting out very small. Um, today, somewhere around 25,000 sites which support login from OpenID. Once again, this is very hard to measure because OpenID is not centralized. There is no one server on the internet, no one company that every OpenID transaction, every OpenID login goes through. It's all spread out. So this is sort of an estimate from a number perspective. It's what's seen by one OpenID provider, but much more of a trend. I mean, being able to go and put up a slide like this of companies that, and software projects which are working with OpenID, that are shipping OpenID. I mean, it's amazing. It's emerged from blogging uh, to open source, to Web 2.0, to large companies, to enterprises, to all these different sorts of things. And so the challenge now is how do you take a technology which is used by early adopters um, to something that becomes more mainstream? And so this was a meeting that happened yesterday um, talking about usability and user experience around OpenID. And so really 40 people got together from a variety of companies, um, sometimes even competitors to one another, and are all working of how can we help advance this sort of technology to be something that, that makes the entire web better. So if we take a look at authorization, I want to just uh, touch on this for a minute. There's another technology um, which is gaining a lot of steam called OAuth. And the idea here is to get rid of that problem of you sign up for a new site and ask you for your Gmail password. Be being able to start sharing some of that information without having to share your password. So being able to give limited access to your account. So one way that this has been traditionally done is by secret URLs or secret email addresses. But if you just saw what was under that black, photo, uh, that black bar, you could go and post photos to my Flickr account. So as soon as this secret email address becomes not so secret, then it doesn't work so well anymore. So the idea with OAuth is being able to change this from instead of having these secret things, these passwords which give access to your entire account or a secret URL or a secret email address, you to have to just explicitly give access. So this is um, movable type which powers my website and I want to go and set up my location. So I'm using a service um, from Yahoo called Fire Eagle which is sort of like a location broker. Multiple things can go and update my location, and then different sites can go and ask for my location. So I'm going to go in here and say, yes, I want to connect to my Fire Eagle account, um, which sends me over to Yahoo. So now I'm on Yahoo, and I'm logging in on Yahoo. So instead of that screenshot at the beginning of my presentation where I was giving away my password on another website, I'm logging in like I would do normally. I'm not sharing my password with a different website that I shouldn't share it with. From there, Fire Eagle asks me and gives me control over the granularity of the information that I want to share. Do I want to share my exact GPS coordinates of where I'm standing, or do I want to um, go and share what country I'm in? I chose my neighborhood or small town, and so once I hit confirm, then I come back and my website's able to find out that I'm in Barcelona. So being able to do all of this without having to share my password. I think this is going to be another one of those technologies which is going to become really important because it allows us to create these experiences, whether it be for social networking online, whether it be for business transactions or anything in between, where users understand what's going on. They're able to remain in control over the information that they share. They're able to go back and revoke that later. They're not giving away their passwords, which are the complete keys to the kingdom, which I think means that they'll have more, more trust in the entire system. Because if I know that I can share something with you and later revoke it if you're not being good, I'm willing to share more up front. 
And so I think that's another thing to think about um, as you're looking at building systems is how can I start to develop a relationship with my users? So instead of just saying, hey, tell me everything about yourself before we've even shook hands and said, nice to meet you, how can you start to sort of build that relationship online like you do in, um, in, an, in the real world? So the idea with relationships and contacts, sort of getting us from the the people that you want to use on every social service, uh, social network, are the people in your address book to being able to give you more control over that. So there's a technology called the Portable Contacts API, which is um, starting to emerge. And the idea is this is a um, developer tool which allows you to say, I want to share some of my friends, or are you friends with this person? So being able to give users, again, more control over the information that they're sharing when you're looking at how do you start uh, distributing social networks. And the types of things that you're able to build with this, I mean, this is an example from Flickr, not necessarily using portable contacts, but replacing that email, that email address and password. So it says, hey, find your friends from your Google account, but instead of there being a password, you're sent over to Google, sort of like when I was looking at sharing my location. I'm able to grant access, deny access, and find people um, on the service that I wasn't already connected with. Sort of where Portable Contacts takes that a step further is you're able to do things like who, are, who has signed up for the service in the past week since the last time I checked? So this is a service called Doppler, which is sort of uh, another location-based service. And what this means is that they can continue checking for who are new people that you might know. And being able to do this without you being present, without you having to give away your password again. So I think the Portable Contacts API, once again, I mean, it's something that's really just starting right now. So it'll probably be a year or two before it really becomes something that's built into many sites. But it's something that a lot of companies are really interested in because it allows them to go and build these interfaces, these experiences, which are much more natural to normal people. I think that's one of the things that we need to look at with these technologies is even though one by themselves might be a little strange, how can we start combining them together so that the experiences online become more normal. So um, activities, very much emerging work, this idea of having these feeds of what are people doing online um, and sort of getting to the point of how can we break them down and describe them. So having an actor, having a verb, a social object, sort of how do we describe this in a way that's portable between these different services. So if I'm going and doing something on Facebook, it can be understood on MySpace and vice versa. Gadgets. So I want to talk for a minute about open social. Um, the idea of instead of developers having to go and write for each of these different social networks differ separately, being able to go and unify that. And the interesting part about open social for me is looking at the Facebook platform, which has been incredibly successful. Lots of developers working with it, lots of applications. Facebook has 100 million active users. If you go and add up all of the different social networks which are now shipping open social applications, 350 million active users. So another thing to think about from a business perspective of even though, the, I mean, some of the traditional thinking has been if you do something that's unique, have it be the only thing for your site, yes, that will make you successful for a while, but others will end up wanting to do the same thing. And in the end, those few networks added together will actually dwarf what you're able to do. So getting to this point where I'm able to have my website, I'm able to go and pull together people I know, have it be my profile, have it mark up my location, all these different things, and do it in a way that computers can understand as well as humans. I think that's really interesting for me, and I think it will become more and more interesting for mainstream users as well, because it means that you'll be able to have a really rich profile online that gets you into all sorts of different services. And companies are embracing this too. I mean, Yahoo launched their new profiles last week, and they put out this giant banner on the side of their building saying, we're open, with logos of these various technologies. Or you have Joseph Smarr from Plaxo looking at sort of this idea of an open stack. And you have, I mean, MySpace, Yahoo, and Google all building with these same five technologies, working together on them. I mean, it, this is a really interesting time to be in compared to a few years ago where these companies would all be doing their independent thing like what Facebook's been doing. So I want to just end by um, encouraging people to go check out our weekly video podcast, The Social Web TV. Um, 
we do sort of 10 to 20 minute shows every week talking about these so different sorts of things. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for having me here. Um, really appreciate the, ability, the chance to come out um, to Barcelona, talk to all of you, and I'll be around um, this entire afternoon for questions or definitely feel free to email me. Thank you. Anything in, um, which I think is definitely one of the benefits to OpenID, but um, really more so this idea of being able to go and start to take more parts of your profile with you as you move around the web, making it easier for you to get into new services. Lots of people have been saying great things about OpenID, um, which is good, awesome. Um, it was well. So if I were to tell Yahoo that I'm that Flickr user, or if I were to tell Magnolia that I'm that Flickr user, I could go ahead and share where my photos are. So this idea of starting to not just have it be, this is your identity by itself, but who are you on the web? And giving you the ability to choose what you want to share. And so now I'm back at Magnolia, I'm logged in. So not having to type any ID login goes through. It's all spread out. So this is sort of an estimate from a number perspective. It's what's seen by one OpenID provider, but much more of a trend. I mean, being able to go and put up a slide like this of companies that, and software projects which are working with OpenID, that are shipping OpenID. I mean, it's amazing. It's emerged from blogging uh, to, so assuming the internet um, is uh, working for us, we're, we're over at Yahoo. I'm already signed into Yahoo. I go to Yahoo every day when I start my browser, so I'm already signed in. It's an account which I'm constantly using. And so from here, it allows me to choose what identity I want to pass to it. It remembers which one I used last. Um, I have my Flickr account. If we take a look at some of the uh, adoption, I mean, this is the sort of graph that you want to see. Um, up and to the right, starting out very small. Um, today, somewhere around 25,000 sites which support login from OpenID. Once again, this is very hard to measure because OpenID is not centralized. There is no one server on the internet, no one company that every OpenID transaction, every 